everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Liz. Today I'm going to be talking all about my labour and delivery story. First I want to say a massive thank you if you've watched my first video which was all about my pregnancy. If you haven't seen that video yet I will encourage you to go back and watch that one before you watch this one because it will give you a little bit of a backstory all about my pregnancy journey and just give a little bit more context to my actual labour and delivery. So I'm going to give you a second to pause the video and go and watch that now if you haven't already. So I asked you guys on Instagram if you had any questions for me regarding my birth story and I got a few so I'm actually going to include those in the last portion of this video so stay tuned for those. Before I start I just wanted to say a little disclaimer for those of you who may be pregnant now or close to your due date. This story is entirely my own experience, it's not intended to scare you at all or put you off. I'm just sharing my experience for anyone who might be interested or might be going through a similar thing with regards to being pregnant, being a new mum and giving birth during this crazy time. I just wanted to put that out there before I start this video. So please take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Going back into this experience may trigger some emotions for me, it may trigger some emotions for you if you've gone through a similar experience already. So I'll encourage you to sit down and grab a cup of tea and a snack and let's get into the video. So my official due date was the 14th of August 2020. I had a midwife appointment on that day. I'm not gonna lie, I was hoping and a big part of me actually really did think that my baby was going to come early before her due date. I thought it would be at least a week, maybe two weeks, even though I did read that statistically first pregnancies usually do arrive late. I think I was just basing it off of how big I had gotten during my last trimester and how she was actually measuring during my scans. But sure enough, I arrived to my due date and she was not here yet. I went to my midwife appointment and she had actually offered for me to get a sweep done. Usually if you do reach your due date or you go over, most midwives will offer you a sweep. It's entirely your choice whether you decide to do that or not. For those of you who are wondering what the hell is a sweep? I'm going to put in a little explanation here so that you can familiarise yourself. They're not the nicest of things to experience. It's rather invasive. Especially when you're ready to pop and you're just feeling heavy. It's really not what you want to be doing at that moment in time but i was just like you know what if this is gonna help the baby to come along then let's just do it prior to that actually i was thinking in my mind i'm not gonna do it and i'm just gonna let her come when she wants to come but i ended up doing it and it was super uncomfortable I'm not gonna lie. But obviously it is an optional service. However, after discussing it with my midwife, she did recommend it to me just because of how big the baby was measuring. And every day that she stays in there past my due date, she's only gonna get bigger and bigger. And it may be um, a case where if she gets too big, it might be difficult for me to deliver her naturally. And that is not what I wanted at all. When she was doing it, she did say that my cervix was still quite high up. So in my head, that was like, oh great, it might still take like a week for her to come. So fast forward to three days later, it's the 17th of August, 1am. So it's just turned the 17th of August and my water's broke. I think my water just broke. Unfortunately, I'd only had about an hour or so of sleep at this point and pretty much instantaneously I started getting mild twinges. So I ended up calling the hospital shortly after and was advised to just take some paracetamol and try and get as much sleep as possible. So that's what I did, but I ended up really not getting much sleep at all, probably just a couple of hours disturbed sleep 
going in and out. It got to the morning now and the contractions started to intensify a little bit. I called the hospital again. She had advised me to try and come in because having my waters broken for a certain amount of time is not really advisable because your chances of infection and infection to the baby increases. But I was adamant that I wanted to try and get through as much of the labour at home as I possibly could just in the comfort of my own space. So it got to about midday now and things started to ramp up. The contractions were getting a little bit painful at this point. I had to really kind of breathe through them and focus on them. They weren't unbearable though, probably only coming about five or six minutes apart. So I knew that I wasn't really anywhere close. Obviously because it had been about 12 hours since my waters had broken, I was obviously concerned of the health of myself and the baby. So I called the hospital again and they advised me to come in as soon as I could. We got ourselves ready and we headed to the hospital. When I called the hospital, they told me to come to the place where I got my scans done during my pregnancy which was at a different facility to where the actual main hospital is with the labour ward and everything so I thought it was a bit strange that they told me to go there but nevertheless we got in a cab and we headed there when I was getting out of the cab I was getting a contraction so I had to hold on to a nearby tree and just try and breathe through it Next thing I know, this woman's running out, asking me why I'm in labour and asking me why we came to this place. And I told her, obviously, it's where we were told to go when, in actual fact, we were meant to go to the labour ward. However, they did manage to find somebody to assess me there, but I wasn't actually dilated at all <laughs> during this point. And I was like, Are you serious? Like, I've been going through these contractions, my waters have been broken for all this time. How am I not dilated at all? Like, are you being serious right now? By this point, obviously I was getting tired. I hadn't really eaten much and I felt like anything that I was eating just wasn't doing anything for my energy levels. We ended up getting another cab and going back up the road to the hospital even though it was only about a 10 minute walk away. I wasn't about to do a walk in my state, do you know what I mean? So we finally get to the labour ward now and I'm told that my partner isn't allowed to join me while I'm getting assessed there. Cue emotional breakdown. I had had enough. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. This is what I had been dreading the whole time. I was pregnant, I was keeping up with the updates on the restrictions at my particular hospital because obviously during the pandemic in the UK different hospitals and trusts have different rules about visiting hours about when your partner or when your birth partner is allowed to be with you at what stage in your delivery etc etc so being told this knowing that he may not be able to be with me for hours really did stress me out a lot. When I got to the reception area, the woman that was there was just not very sympathetic at all, not very helpful. When you're in that kind of emotional state, you really need somebody to lean on or somebody to just show you some kindness. So it just kind of sent me over the edge really. And I ended up sitting there in the reception area, just sobbing my eyes out. And it wasn't until about half an hour later when they actually came to get me. And the woman that came to get me put me in this room and just hooked me up to these monitors where they were going to track my contractions, the frequency of them, the intensity of them, to try and determine where I am in my labour. And I ended up sitting in this room by myself for about two to three hours and I had no pain relief. So I was going through these contractions that were coming every two, three minutes at this point with no pain relief and no one there to hold my hand or reassure me or just chat to me to take my mind off things. And knowing that my partner was sitting outside, bless him, my heart went out to him because as much as I was suffering, I knew that he was also suffering. No partner wants to know that their wife is going through labor and in pain and going through contractions and their baby is on the way and they can't even be with them to join them even though they're in the same freaking building. Do you know what I mean? It's just so dumb. It didn't make any sense to me, it was super frustrating, but 
I was trying not to focus on that because I'm not gonna lie, I was crying a lot during that time. The midwife that was attending to me came to check on me and see how my contractions were getting on and she could obviously see that I wasn't in a good state and I was super emotional. She wasn't being sympathetic to me directly but after a few hours she actually did get a doctor to come in and assess me and I think by that point I was maybe one centimetre. So really things are moving super slowly. Thankfully she didn't send me home and she let me move to a private room inside the labour ward and allowed my partner to come and join me. Even though the restrictions at that time apparently were you weren't allowed to have your partner join you until you were four centimetres dilated or in active labour as they say. So I was super grateful of that fact but if they hadn't have let me I think I would have been super pissed off because of the state that I was in. It wasn't going to be good for me or the baby and you know they say that you need to try and let the oxytocin flow as much as possible to try and um, relax and let the baby move down naturally and get labour going as quick as possible. But because I was so stressed out and emotional, it might have been a reason why everything was moving so slowly. So it was a big relief that my hubby was able to join me. But then the real fun began. We had a midwife with us who was just literally in the corner of the room taking notes on her little laptop and just kind of observing the situation really. She did offer me some pain relief or gas and air. However, because I was obviously feeling so drained of energy, I didn't actually end up taking any gas and air because I was just a bit concerned that it was gonna make me a little bit more dizzy and out of it and weak. But I was actually a little bit disappointed because the whole time I was pregnant I was actually looking forward to taking the gas and air. After watching so many One Born Every Minute episodes, I was like, Yes, I can't wait for this gas and air. But I ended up not even having one little puff of it. She did say, oh, you know, you can just try it and see how you feel, but I ended up not taking it at all. By this time, it's about six, seven in the evening, and my contractions are getting intense and they were all around my lower back and towards my bum, which was a very weird feeling, I'm not gonna lie to you. It wasn't what I was expected. I thought it was obviously gonna be all around the front of my tummy and the pressure going towards my crotch, but it was completely the opposite direction. It was obviously getting later on in the evening now, and by this point, the night shift midwives and doctors had come to start their shift, and they all do the rounds to check on all the women in the room and when they got to me they kind of all surrounded my bed and explained to me that because it had been such a long time that my waters had been gone at this point you know it's going on 16 hours so we're getting into dangerous territory here and because I wasn't progressing much on my own they suggested for me to go on the hormone drip to get things moving a bit quicker and because I was so exhausted and I hadn't really eaten much as well it was the best thing to do however I wanted to try and see if I could just get a little bit further on my own I was determined to try and do this as naturally as possible because my original plan was to actually have a water birth and I was envisioning being able to do that during my pregnancy, but you cannot have a water birth if your waters have been gone for that amount of time because the risk of infection is gonna be way too high. So that wasn't the case for me. However, they did let me have a bath and initially the bath did really help to just relax me and ease some of the contractions. However, I think the hot water and just the sheer length of how long I'd been going through this made me feel a little bit dizzy and my heart rate started to increase a lot and I started to get really shaky and I think my body was basically going into shock from the pain. So that wasn't really ideal. From that point after I got out of the bath they explained to me that the hormone drip would obviously increase the intensity and the frequency of the contractions and because of how long I'd been in labour for they recommended for me to have some pain relief so I ended up actually opting to get the epidural. Yeah! 
because at this point I was just in so much pain and I had only progressed to four centimeters by myself naturally and it wasn't really moving quick enough and for the safety of myself and the baby it was the best thing to do. So by this point it was actually going on to early hours of the morning after they put me on the drip I ended up actually having to wait a while for the anesthesiologist to come and administer my epidural because he was actually in theatre with a c-section at that time and obviously before he started the process he had to explain to me all of the potential risks. I should say as well that the whole time I had been hooked up to the heart monitors to obviously monitor my heart rate, the baby's heart rate and the length and intensity of my contractions. Coming from someone that's not used to a hospital environment, hearing all these beeps and noises around you, it's very foreign. Coming from someone that suffers from anxiety already, hearing your heart rate beat super fast and being able to feel it in your chest is not something that is comforting at all. It's not going to make me calm down. I was just trying to distract myself from all of the noise but I knew that at this point this was pretty much my only option. Luckily, this epidural was one that I could control myself. So basically the initial dose that he puts into the drip lasts for a few hours and then once you start to feel it wear off, you have a little button next to you and you press it again and it releases another dose of the epidural. This is one that I could kind of deal with myself so that gave me some comfort in knowing that. My body at this point was still shaking and I think one of the side effects for the epidural is actually that. My body ended up kind of shaking uncontrollably and because my anxiety was so high as well it sent my heart rate just soaring. The midwives actually were quite concerned because because my heart rate was almost at the rate that babies was, which was probably like in the 130s, which is crazy high and not normal. And obviously me knowing that didn't make me feel any better. I actually did start to get some weird chest pains. That just freaked me out loads. They actually had a doctor come round, try to talk to me, calm me down and explain that this is a normal side effect of having an epidural. Everything's gonna be fine. He actually ended up doing an ECG on me, which is where they kind of hook up all of these tabs to your body and just make sure that everything's okay with your heart. Everything came back normal and it was fine, so that gave me some peace of mind in knowing that that was okay and it was just obviously the anxiety that was making me feel like this and of course the epidural as well. So I tried my best to just kind of shut my eyes, get a bit of sleep, try to rest a bit and prepare myself for what was to come. It was quite difficult to relax due to my body shaking uncontrollably, but by the time the morning rolled around, we had a new set of doctors and midwives. So this is the third set now. So the midwife that we had, I was pretty sure that she was gonna be the one that ended up giving birth to our baby. And she was a lovely Nigerian lady. She really helped to calm me down. She was chatting with me, telling me about her kids and her birth story. And when she next examined me, it turned out that I was actually eight centimeters. <laughs> I knew that I was super close. I felt a lot more calmer knowing that my body was doing what it needed to do. So I knew it was only a matter of time before my baby girl was going to arrive. At that point, it was the calmest I had felt since my waters broke. I just kind of felt this overall warmth and ease just come over me. It was almost like God was telling me that everything was gonna be okay. And I was actually getting quite excited for the pushing part because I knew that it was coming up soon. The midwife told me that she would come back in an hour or so to check me. At this point, I was just kind of chatting to hubby, eating a little bit where I could, trying to gain some energy or the next step. So when the midwife came back, she examined me again and I was fully dilated. At this point, I could kind of tell for myself because I was feeling a lot of pressure down there. And even though I did have the epidural, I could feel that there was pressure. So I knew that I was ready to push, basically. We interrupt this program for an important news announcement. Hi, Ocean. Come to mommy. I'm just talking about how you came into this world. 
Yes. Oh. Say hi to the camera. Woo. <laughs> And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So the next time the midwife came back and examined me, I was actually fully dilated and we were able to get going. At this point, I was just super excited for her to arrive. I knew that my baby was going to be with me in a matter of minutes. The good thing about having the epidural was I was able to enjoy the process. So after the pushing process began, to my surprise, it only took 30 minutes for her to arrive into this world. So before I knew it, I had my beautiful baby girl in my arms and she was just everything. I could have ever dreamed of and more the moment that she was put on my chest she just looked up at me with her big beautiful brown eyes and i looked into her eyes and we had this moment that is a moment that i will never ever forget after the long slog that was my flipping 36 something hour labor in total all of these months of waiting to find out what she'd looked like everything was so worth it Right, so little one is going to have to join me for this last portion, guys, because she's not a happy bunny with Papa right now. So I hope you don't mind that she just sits here and chills with me while we finish the video. Hi, boo-boo. So since you're here, do you want to introduce yourself, bubs? This is Baby Ocean, everybody. She's now five months and a bit, aren't you? So let me just finish the story. So during the birth, I actually did end up tearing a little bit. Oh, no. Nothing worse than a first degree tear, but I did need to get a few stitches. Daddy actually ended up holding her while I got stitched up. And that did mean that we couldn't start our breastfeeding journey straight away because she also ended up needing to go to the NICU for some reason. They were concerned about her breathing. She ended up having to go to the NICU ward. She was there for a few hours while they were checking her out. So later on, we ended up being transferred to the postnatal ward. Before we entered, my partner actually had to go home. Him not being able to join us really did upset me. Going through those first few days alone with her were really super difficult because I had caught a temperature during my labour and because my waters had been gone for so long, they were concerned that we had caught an infection so we both had to be put on antibiotics and needed monitoring for three days after the birth. Yeah. During that time due to covid restrictions my partner was only allowed to join us from the hours of two till eight in the afternoon <laughs> which was really hard because prior to that obviously partners were allowed to be there for 24 hours oh So she's just gone back to her dad while I finish up this video, but yeah. Prior to COVID, the visiting hours for your birthing partner didn't really exist. So they were allowed to be next to you by your bedside 24 seven. It was really, really difficult to be alone with her during the most monumental transitional point in my life thus far. I will say that I had to dig down deep to find strength that I didn't know existed, even though I had to already try and mentally and emotionally prepare myself for it because I pretty much knew that that's what was coming. I think a part of me still hoped that that wasn't gonna be the case. I just felt really frustrated that if I'd have had my baby a year earlier, 
even six months earlier, that wouldn't have been the case. At the end of the day, everything happens for a reason. I like to believe that God doesn't give you anything you can't handle in life. It did make me feel somewhat empowered to a degree that I had the strength within me to really fight and get through that time. And although the midwives did help where they could, I was essentially alone with my new baby. You know, you've got people coming in and out, doing checks and you're trying to get on with your breastfeeding journey and deal with the postnatal stress and the exhaustion. It was really overwhelming and quite stressful and I do really believe that if I was able to have him there with me then it would have been a lot easier but I didn't have a choice in the matter, I just had to get on with it. I am not currently up to date on the rules and restrictions within the hospitals at the moment so if you yourself are pregnant and expecting soon then I recommend that you look up your hospital and trust rules and regulations with regards to your birthing partner and what will be the case for you postnatally as even though it can change from week to week it would do you justice to be able to even just mentally prepare yourself for what to expect when that time does come. So unfortunately my baby was incredibly sleepy when she was a fresh newborn and usually that is very common most newborns when they're fresh out of the womb are incredibly sleepy however this did make it quite difficult to get her to latch on obviously my milk as well had not come in properly so I just had colostrum so it was quite difficult to get anything in her really to be honest because I was so exhausted as well and I didn't have much support with me at the time and obviously the midwives come and go and they change so it's not like you just got one midwife with you helping you through your entire journey until you get discharged from the hospital they're coming and going so it's almost like as much as you have notes on the system you have to keep explaining and updating people on the situation and what's going on i would say if i was to have another baby then i would make sure that i had pre-made formula ready to go with me even though the hospitals can provide you with formula when i was asked by one midwife i think on the second day that i was there she recommended that i give the baby formula because she hadn't had much milk and she was just incredibly sleepy but i was just adamant that i was going to exclusively breastfeed her really i think it would have saved me a lot of stress and worry if i'd have just given her some formula because even though it wasn't picked up on when we were discharged on the third day after she'd had her blood test she actually ended up developing jaundice so it was the first day that she was home the whites of her eyes were starting to look quite yellow if you know about jaundice then you know that that's one of the main signs that a baby has jaundice not only when her skin is looking yellow obviously because she is a mixed race baby it was quite hard to tell whether her skin was looking yellow anyway but the telltale sign was the whites of her eyes so my motherly intuition was telling me to go and get her checked out because we were struggling to a degree with the breastfeeding i just wanted to make sure that she was okay so we ended up going to a and e that night obviously my hubby was not allowed to join me once again so he had to wait outside while we waited to be checked over she needed to have a blood test and then we needed to obviously wait for the results to tell us what her bilirubin levels were this is a quite a lengthy process because they have one test where they spin the blood that can be done pretty much instantaneously and doesn't take long at all however it's not as accurate as another test that they can do they ended up i think doing both they basically have to prick the heel of your baby's foot and squeeze the blood out into a vial until they have enough to be able to test the blood. This was extremely traumatizing for me because she was crying. 
I was exhausted and overwhelmed. We'd not even been home for one day before we were back in the hospital. I didn't expect this to be the case because no one had picked up on it in the hospital, even though her bilirubin levels were probably rising during the time that we were there initially. But because they were under the treatment line because she is a full-term baby, they obviously didn't pick up on it and apparently jaundice is extremely common in newborn babies. I think as much as 50% of babies end up having jaundice. A probably smaller percentage of that would actually need treatment for it because usually they can process it themselves and just dispel it through their wheeze and poos. However, not knowing about this, being a first time mum, just having my baby a few days ago and being extremely overwhelmed during the process, it was just way too much for me to handle and my anxiety was through the roof. Normally, in previous years, when I'd experienced bad bouts of anxiety, I would take calms because they are a herbal remedy and they would usually help to calm me down if I was on the verge of a panic attack or just feeling super anxious. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to take those if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. I guess there's not enough research done so knowing that I couldn't take those, it was extremely difficult to calm myself down, especially not being able to have my partner with me for most of the process just made it even worse. I also felt really badly for him because he was there in the vicinity, but he wasn't allowed to physically be there and it just made no sense to me. So when we got the results back, we actually found out that she did have high bilirubin levels, but they were not high enough to be treated with phototherapy. So we were told to come back in 24 hours and see if they had increased or decreased. When we came back the next day, they had increased slightly, but not enough again to be classed as needing the treatment. So it was the most frustrating thing having to go back and forth just not be able to rest my body, not be able to relax and adjust and just spend those first weeks nestled with my baby in my home. It was really hard, not what I was expecting at all, to be honest with you. I had basically had enough. She was obviously still suffering from the jaundice but she wasn't, luckily, I mean, accelerating very high that she needed the treatment, but also not going low enough where I felt comfortable to be at home knowing that it would just go away by itself because it could potentially skyrocket and there would be no way that I would be able to tell myself at home because it can take weeks even after the jaundice has gone or is not at a dangerous level for the yellow colouring to leave her skin and her eyes. So without doing these blood tests, there's really no way for me to know. So we had no choice but to keep going back and forth from the hospital and that meant more blood tests for her, more stress for me and daddy. It got to a point where I had just basically asked to be readmitted. Not that it was necessary, but because one, I was struggling with the stress of going back and forth from the hospital every day. Two, I would also need help with my breastfeeding journey, particularly during her first weeks, knowing that she had jaundice, it was really important to make sure that she was feeding regularly and that she was getting enough milk and that we could monitor her wheeze and poos to know that she was kind of getting rid of it herself. So we ended up having to be readmitted to the hospital. We ended up spending an extra four days there. Each day she was getting more blood tests and at this point I had also decided to give her formula as well as breastfeeding because we needed to know that she was getting a certain amount of fluids so that she could also expel a certain amount and we could help her body along with the process of dispelling all the bilirubin and getting rid of the jaundice. Every single day she was getting tested and her levels were going a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit up, a little bit down, but still below the line that they would class as needing the phototherapy treatment. It was just so frustrating for me day in, day out, just in this limbo land, her not needing the treatment, which was a good thing, 
but also us not being able to go home because they wanted to keep us in to make sure that her levels didn't increase a lot. It wasn't until the fourth day, evening of the fourth day, where she had her last two tests and her results had dropped enough for them to feel comfortable with us going home. But that wasn't the end of it. We then had to visit a local jaundice clinic twice during the next few days and weeks after we were allowed to come home to check her levels again. And the first time that we got them checked was I think two days after we had returned back from the hospital for the second time. What they do in the clinic, they can't spin the blood. So they do a skin test, which is super inaccurate. And if that skin test is over a certain percentage or number, then they send you back to the A&E to get a spin test done. And obviously, because her jaundice levels hadn't dropped enough at that point, they sent me back to A&E. So we had gone back to A&E for maybe the fourth or fifth time during the first two weeks of her being born. Luckily, when we had the final results from that time, her jaundice levels had significantly dropped. So we were okayed to go back home and just continue with the feeding. Bless her, it wasn't an easy start into this world, but she is doing great now. As you guys saw, she is super healthy and happy and growing really well. As much as that experience for me was not without its difficulties, I'm so grateful that it wasn't anything worse. It gave me peace of mind knowing how common jaundice is. At the end of the day, I was actually quite glad that she didn't need the phototherapy treatment because if it can be avoided, that's the most ideal outcome. So now I am going to answer some of the questions that I got on Instagram. So the first question that I got was, did you have a birth plan? Did it go according to plan and what would you do differently? Yes, I did have a birth plan. I had actually read a book called The Positive Birth Movement, I think it's called. If I would recommend you ladies read any book during your pregnancy, it would be that one. It was super informative and helpful. It's got loads of information with every single type of possible birth and everything you need to know about giving birth to really help you make an informed decision. And it's also written by a UK author, so it is relevant to the procedures in this country. And that book has got loads of examples of different possible birth plans. It's really helpful in case you don't have any idea where to start, like I didn't. I really needed those examples to help me make my own mind up about what kind of birth I wanted. So yes, I did have a birth plan. I had initially, as I said earlier, planned for a water birth, but obviously that wasn't the case but I had written many other different details in there about how I wanted my birth to go and what I was and wasn't comfortable with. No it obviously didn't quite go to plan but it went the best way that it could have given the situation and given the fact that my waters had been broken for such a long time. Next question, how was it like giving birth during lockdown? I have mentioned my feelings towards that in the video, but I will just touch on it again here. Yes, it was very difficult to give birth during lockdown. However, I was lucky to give birth at that particular time in August because the restrictions for my particular hospital had calmed down somewhat. I was grateful that I wasn't one of those unlucky women to have given birth during the peak of lockdown in April, May, because I believe the restrictions were very strict at that time. Okay, next question. Knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently? I'm due in late March, early April, and very much looking for tips. So yes, I would have done a few things differently, I think, now looking back. Obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing. I thought that I was pretty organised already in terms of getting my hospital bag ready. I would say snacks and drinks. You can never have enough. Bring loads. They don't really give you much in the hospital and there's not much to choose from either and depending on what hospital you're at there's not really a lot of opportunity especially if you're on your own to be able to get snacks during that time. <music> 
best snacks I would say to get through labour are flat leucosate, coconut water for those electrolytes and obviously normal still water. Lara bars are really great as well. I loved the chocolate chip ones. They're full of dates and just really good for natural energy. Um, bananas are great as well for slow release energy. They're not too heavy on the stomach either. Also, I don't know if you've heard of those dextrose um, they're kind of like sweets, but they basically have a lot of glucose in them, like extra added vitamin C, so good for a boost of energy as well. Hopefully by the time that you are due to give birth, the situation will have calmed down a lot and that you'll be able to have your partner there with you through the entire journey. Another thing that I would also do differently is be more open-minded to giving your newborn formula. For most women, your milk doesn't come through to at least day three and unless you've done a lot of colostrum harvesting through the last few weeks of your pregnancy which I didn't really do to be honest it's more likely that your baby will end up getting jaundice it will be also more difficult to introduce a bottle later on and what happened with me even though after I realized that she did have the jaundice and we introduced the formula we were still breastfeeding as well so we were combination feeding and she actually ended up just weaning herself off of the formula at about two three months old so by that point her body had gotten rid of all of the jaundice so it wasn't really that necessary for her to be having formula so now we're actually just exclusively breastfeeding right guys i think that's all we've got time for today as my battery is flashing at me and we are losing sunlight as it is now past 4 p.m here in the uk it's getting dark and i don't want the lighting to change too much about this video so i think i'm just gonna round it up here massive thank you for watching this video and if you got this far please give the video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more if you have any questions or video requests please leave a comment down below and i will see you guys in the next one